hope and light just saying these brings up the images of a spirituality influencer but no hope and light are the names of two of the world's most famous diamonds the hope diamond and the kohinoor which means mountain of light both the diamonds hope and light come from india india was the world's only source of diamonds until 1725 when diamond mines were discovered in Brazil which is why the world's oldest texts on gemology also come from India and they include sophisticated classification systems for different kinds of stones in many ancient indian courts jewelry rather than clothing was the principal form of adornment and a visible sign of court hierarchy with strict rules being laid down to establish which rank of courtier could wear which gem and in which setting historians william dalrymple and anita anand tell us although it's impossible to know the definitive journey and history of the kohinoor in this video what i want to do is try to trace the written record of the kohinoor as far as we can we in india think our claim is self evident the iranians say it belongs to them the taliban has asked for it back lahore is now in pakistan therefore the kohinoor belongs to pakistan it represents colonization of bloodshed give it back to india i don't see why an indian child from india has to travel all the way to the but uk to look at it and just pay for it india has been pressing the uk to return it london has been ignoring these calls they simply rejected india's request they said the ownership of the kohinoor was quote unquote non negotiable the exact origins of the kohinoor diamond are lost to the mists of time and one of the reasons it's hard to trace the kohinoor's history is because of its name the name kohinoor was given to it only in the 1700s by iran's nadir shah it is believed the kohinoor was found in india's alluvial mines around the 12th or the 13th century century AD sifted from the sands of a river bed in the Kolur mines on the southern bank of the Krishna river in the former Golconda Sultanate which was then under the Kakatiya dynasty up until 1304 the diamond was in the possession of the rajas of Malwa how it got there from Golconda no enough reliable records for that then in 1304 it came into the possession of the sultan of delhi alauddin khilji and probably stayed there with the delhi sultanate because from 1526 the mughal ruler babar mentions the diamond in his writings babar nama kohinoor came into babar's possession after he defeated ibrahim lodi of the delhi sultanate in the battle of panipat he describes the diamond's value equal to half day production costs of the world then we know that in 1628 babar's great great grandson shah jahan who is famous for having commissioned the taj mahal also commissioned a magnificent gem stone and crusted throne the likes of which the world had never seen the peacock throne it was inspired by the fabled throne of solomon the hebrew king who figures in the histories of islam judaism and christianity shah jahan's peacock throne took 7 years to make costing four times as much as the taj mahal among the many precious stones that adorned the peacock throne were two particularly enormous gems the timur ruby more highly valued by the moguls because they preferred colored stones and the kohinoor diamond a symbol of regality wealth and class perhaps the mughal empire was the wealthiest in asia its capital delhi was home to more than 2 million people more than london and paris combined but that kind of prosperity attracts the attention of invaders and soon enough persia's nadir shah invaded delhi in 1739 by this time even though the mughal empire was rich it wasn't powerful at all nadir's invasion is described as a time quote when all of india trembled with horror end quote the brutal carnage that ensued killed tens of thousands of people and severely impoverished the mughal wealth 
Nadir Shah left India with so much gold and so many gems that the looted treasure required 700 elephants, 4,000 camels and 12,000 horses to pull it. Nadir took the peacock throne as well. He removed the Timur ruby and the Kohinoor diamond from the throne and wore both on his armband, a symbol of pride perhaps. It was he who gave the diamond its current name, Kohinoor, meaning Mountain of Light. Less than 10 years after looting the diamond, Nadir Shah in 1747 was assassinated by beheading. The diamond now belonged to one of his generals, Ahmad Shah Durrani, who went on to found the Durrani dynasty in Afghanistan. The Kohinoor remained in Afghanistan for nearly 70 years. It passed between the hands of various rulers in one blood-soaked episode after another, including a king who blinded his own son and a deposed ruler whose shaved head was coronated with molten gold. Yes, that is history, not just fiction. The Kohinoor landed in the hands of Ahmad Shah's grandson, Shah Shuja Durrani. But during the Anglo-Sikh wars, the Lion of Punjab, Maharaja Ranjit Singh, captured Lahore and expelled the Afghans from it. He imprisoned Shah Shuja Durrani, tortured his sons in the blistering heat of Lahore, demanding the handover of the Kohinoor diamond. The torture continued and grew into threats of bringing Shah Shuja's daughters into Ranjit Singh's harem. Things got so desperate that Shah Shuja's wife frustratingly threatened to pound the Kohinoor to dust just so Ranjit Singh could never get his hands on it. Ultimately though, Shah Shuja crumbled and in 1813, Kohinoor came into the hands of Maharaja Ranjit Singh. He brought the Kohinoor back to India and got two replicas of it made out of glass to protect it from thieves. He too wore it on his armband over his white robes. This time, the Timur ruby did not accompany the Kohinoor and it was just the diamond as a symbol of its glory and bloody history. Ranjit Singh died in 1836. A civil war followed. Ranjit Singh's first successor was poisoned to death. The next successor died of a smashed skull. The third successor was shot in the chest in an apparent accident. The fate of the Kohinoor was uncertain. By this time, the British imperialists already have their eyes on it. To conquer Ranjit Singh and his vast territory in Punjab, the British needed to yank that symbol of prestige and power from his death armband as the symbol of their power and superiority. Apparently, Ranjit Singh had requested the diamond to go to a sect of Hindu priests, upon which one anonymous British editorial furiously exclaimed, quote, the richest, the most costly gem in the known world has been committed to the trust of a profane, idolatrous and mercenary priesthood, end quote. The editorial urged the British East India Company to do whatever they could to keep track of the Kohinoor so that it might ultimately be theirs. After this violent succession period following Ranjit Singh's death, the throne finally came to his young son, Duleep Singh, who was under the care of his mother, Rani Jindan. The treaty following the Anglo-Sikh wars against the British East India Company stipulated that Dilip Singh could remain Maharaja of Punjab under the quote-unquote care of the British. Of course, Maharani Jindan wasn't fooled. To get complete control over the boy king, Dilip Singh was just 10 years old. The general misconduct and habits of intrigue are sufficient to separate her, Maharani Jindan, from her son, end quote and threw Maharani Jindan into prison, away from her son. In 1849, after imprisoning Jindan, the British forced the 10-year-old Dulip to sign a legal document amending the Treaty of Lahore that required Dulip to give away the Kohinoor and all claim to sovereignty. The lonely boy had no other choice. The Kohinoor now belonged to Queen Victoria of England. In April 1850, the Kohinoor was placed in a chest to leave India for England on a ship. The ship was called Medusa, by the way. In the two-month journey, the entire crew of the ship came down with cholera. On 27th June 1850, Queen Victoria survived an assassination attempt. Three days later, June 30th, 1850, her Prime Minister was trampled to death by his own horse. That same day, Kohinoor 
arrived in England. Just as an aside, all of this adds fuel to the belief that the diamond is cursed, which it is widely believed to be. But how do these ideas of cursed diamonds even begin? Richard Curran, Smithsonian's first distinguished scholar and ambassador at large, is perhaps right when he says, when the powerful take things from the less powerful, the powerless don't have much to do except curse the powerful. And now back to the main video. It was displayed at the 1851 Great Exposition in London, only for the British public to be dismayed at how simple the Kohinoor looked. The Times wrote, quote, many people find a difficulty in bringing themselves to believe from its external appearance that it is anything but a piece of common glass. End quote. Given its disappointing reception, Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's husband, had the stone recut and polished. It was reduced to 60% of its original size. Fun fact, the man who made the first cut into the Kohinoor died of a stroke within weeks. The Kohinoor diamond became part of the British crown jewels. Queen Victoria is said to have stated in her will that the Kohinoor should only be worn by a female. It passed from Victoria to the crown of Queen Alexandra, the wife of Edward VI, Victoria's eldest son, and then to Queen Mary, the wife of George V, grandson of Victoria. It came to the crown of the Queen Mother, wife of George VI, and mother of Queen Elizabeth, and then of course to Queen Elizabeth. But the main question remains, to whom does the Kohinoor rightfully belong? There have been debates, and I suspect they won't stop anytime soon, about returning the diamond to India. I want to say that's where it belongs, but I'm afraid the answer, to whom does the Kohinoor rightfully belong, is not that simple. Does the Kohinoor belong to the one who originally found it? on the riverbed back in the 12th century? Or does it belong to the Kakatiya dynasty who ruled over that region at the time? Does it belong to the people of the Golconda region? Or does it belong to its last owner, Maharaja Dilip Singh? But since he is dead, does it belong to his descendants? There are no known descendants of the family. So does it belong to his subjects, which raises the main and very painful and difficult question to whom do cultural artifacts belong? Do they belong to the king or do they belong to his subjects? Do they belong to a government or to their last owner? The Sikh empire no longer exists and Punjab is now divided between two countries, India and Pakistan. So should the Kohinoor be divided by cutting it up, then it won't be the Kohinoor anymore. The rulers who once owned these gemstones headed nations that no longer exist. Does the Kohinoor belong to India? But India did not even exist as one country before 1947. Wherever it stays and ultimately ends up, it should stay in a museum as a symbol of human nature, our hunger for evermore, pride, our imperialism and brutality. And as long as it stays in England, I'm afraid it's a symbol of imperialism.